Well, for the last few weeks, we have been working through Paul's letter to the Ephesians here at Epiphany. And I think these first few chapters have been encouraging, encouraging us for us to hear. Because they've been all about what God has done for each of us. We heard in chapter 1 that God predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. And that we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. Those are great words. And then last week, we read chapter 2, and Father Michael unpacked for us how God moves us from death to life, from the sphere of the children of wrath to the sphere of God's kingdom says in verse 5, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. I think all of that, all of that is a good reminder of one of the things we always need to remember as we follow Jesus. You see, we do need to remember on one hand that our faith is a path, it's a way, It's not just a moment in time or a single event. But as this first part of Ephesians has emphasized again and again, this is a path and a way that God makes to us before we ever begin the journey to him. These first chapters remind us that if we think we are building building our own way to God, if we think we are really paving a path to him through our actions, our hard work, our spiritual awesomeness, we're confused. And we don't understand what God has already done for us before we ever turn to him. So if this is how we are thinking, we're kind of like somebody that's cutting a trail through the woods, sweating, covered with grime and dirt and stickers and ticks. Well, all the while, just a few feet away, is a perfectly good path that someone else has built for us. As an aside, I actually did do this once. (laughs) My brother Ben and I spent at least two, maybe three days one August, hacking our way through this really dense grove of young aspen trees. If you've ever seen these things, they're, they're kind of like tent poles. They're about like that. They grow about a 18 inches apart at most. You can barely squeeze through them. Well, on the other side of them, there was this really cool beaver pond we found. It had a 300-foot dam on it, the biggest one I've ever seen. So, of course, we had to get back there. And so we're out there. We're sawing away. We're trying not to drop trees on each other. We're covered with sweat and ticks and dirt and grime. And finally, we get to the edge of the pond. And we hit another trail. And we're like, surely this trail does not go where we want to go. So we traced it back, and yeah, sure enough, it came out within about 100 yards of the trail my brother and I built. If only we had scouted the land first, we would have realized we didn't need to do that work. I think sometimes we're like that in our own spiritual lives as well. But back to Ephesians. If you remember one thing about these first chapters we've been reading, It should be that God has already acted decisively to make a way, a path, a trail between us and him. He's built the path. He's made us who were dead in our trespasses alive through Jesus Christ. And that's good to know. It's good to be grateful for that. It's good for us to take these first chapters of of Ephesians as a reminder of, of that good news, that fact that we do not have to pave this way to God. But Paul, of course, doesn't wrap up his letter at this point. He goes on, goes on to chapter 4, which we heard this morning. And this is actually what we'll focus on for our sermon today. So would you turn there? It's page 977 in the Blue Bibles in front of you. So Paul has spent those first chapters explaining all that God has done to make that way, that path to us. And then he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. 
that therefore in this first verse of chapter 4 is a sign that Paul's making a major transition. He's saying, yes, God has built the path, but it's our job to walk on it. God has moved us from death to life, from wrath to grace. Therefore, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And there's more than this, of course, in chapter 4, but this morning we're going to just focus on these beginning verses, this description about how we are to journey on the path God has made for us. And as we do this, we're going to talk about each of these things in Paul's little list here individually. But before that, let's notice what connects them all, what connects humility and gentleness and patience and bearing with one another in love and unity and peace. Well, first, first, I think Paul is telling us that as Christians, we practice these things together with other people. Paul is giving us hikers, so to speak, God's daughters and sons the rules of the road for a journey that we don't actually take alone. We take it with other people. We take it with a church. These are relational virtues. They don't make any sense at all if we just are thinking about ourselves. I know uh, I'm preaching to the choir because you guys are here this morning. (laughs) But we don't do Christianity alone. We do it together, being part of the body of Christ, a local community is necessary for our faith. So Paul begins, therefore, we do these things together because we go on this journey, we walk this way, this path together. So that's the first thing. Secondly, every one of these things Paul commends to us, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love and unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Everyone involves all of us on this journey giving up things or giving way to other people. We know this. For instance, humility, of course, begins when we give up having ourselves in first place. I mean, there's a countercultural idea, particularly here in Northern Virginia, right? Gentleness patience, and bearing with one another in love involve not only giving up first place, but actually putting someone else and their needs in first place. And unity and peace. No unity with anyone over anything is possible until we can put down our private agendas and embrace some common good, right? Paul's words here in Ephesians 4 aren't just some abstract descriptions of vague values. They're concrete commands for how we, when I say we, I mean all of us, me, you, here at Church of the Epiphany, should walk together on God's path. Paul's therefore at the beginning of chapter 4 in Ephesians must be something we pay attention to, something we apply to ourselves I mean, insofar as we also claim to have redemption through Jesus' blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us. All those good things in the first chapters of Ephesians. We must therefore practice these virtues with each other as part of our journey together on the way God has paved for us to himself through Jesus Christ. So do we do that? Are we, uh, to begin where Paul begins here in chapter 4, practicing humility with each other here at church? I mean, we know what that requires of us, right? It means not assuming not only that we have all the answers, but also not assuming that our answers should be the answers that everyone else has. It means practicing the possibility that someone else might actually have the right to our attention and deference and time. Now, this sort of humility isn't easy, is it? 
I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure I'm right about everything. <laughs> Having the humility to acknowledge other possibilities takes real spiritual maturity. I know. I know this call to this sort of humility can even sound a little bit wishy-washy, right? Like not actually standing for our convictions, or if we're in leadership, not actually leading from the front, providing direction. But that's not actually what this sort of humility we're being called to implies. You see, humility practiced in the Christian community, our Christian community here at Epiphany, means doing the hard work of not putting ourselves, our needs, our wants, our preferences at the center of the action every time. God and our neighbor belong in that spot, not us. And of course, the internal dimension of this is very important. It's what Paul is particularly focusing on this morning, how we practice humility among each other in this church. But there's an external dimension to this as well I want us to notice. I think a, a way to think about it um, comes from something William Temple. He was Archbishop of Canterbury during World War II, a scholar, um, a theologian, a disciple of Jesus. And he said this, he said, the church is the only organization that does not exist for itself, but for those who are outside it. Friends, that's a true word. But only if those of us in the church as the church practice the corporate humility of not putting ourselves, our church, at the center of the church and its mission. I wonder, how are we as a church called to put those outside our doors at the center of our life in some way? Who are they? What would that look like? So we're called. Called to humility both amongst each other in our relationship with the broader world. Next, Paul calls us to live with gentleness and patience. You know, one of Jesus' traits I think it's sometimes easy to overlook is his gentleness and patience with people. Isaiah speaks of this in chapter 42. He says, a bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. We often hear those words around Christmas time. Friends, that's gentleness. That's a picture of gentleness towards weak and damaged things. You know, somewhere between most and all of us are bruised reeds and faintly burning wicks, aren't we? We all have hurt spots and sore places and unhealed wounds. They're just the wrong push it can bring the whole edifice down. Paul's telling us here in Ephesians 4 that we should remember that when we walk this way together. Be like Jesus. Be gentle and practice patience with each other, even when we're right. You know, it's possible to be right in the wrong way, to break the reed instead of binding it up, to, as a poor infantry officer in the Vietnam War, made the mistake of telling that reporter Peter Arnett, destroy the town in order to save it. Let's not destroy the town as we follow Jesus, as we walk this way together. So we're called to gentleness and patience like Jesus. Finally, finally Paul tells us that as we walk this way together, we should bear with one another in love and be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. First, I think it's important that we recognize what Paul means here when he says we're to bear with one another in love. Because that's one of those phrases like, oh, that sounds nice, right? Well, basically, friends, this is Paul's nice way of saying, put up with each other. <laughs> Paul is a realist. Scripture is a very realist document. Paul knows, we know that followers of Jesus can annoy each other, right? We can do worse than that. We can hurt each other, can't we? We can make each other suffer. As my mother always said to me, you know, the problem with churches is all the people in them. <laughs> but bearing with one another in love means each of us making the decision 
not to let those other people drive us out of the path or away from the church. Friends, jerky people go to church. None of you, of course, other people. <laughs> just like they go to your office, just like they go to the mall, put up with them. That's actually a Christian virtue, believe it or not. So bear, bear with one another in love. Secondly, Paul says here that we should be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And I think this last little bit is the key to this list. Because this is where we see God's help, even in the midst of this daunting collection of things we ought to do as we walk together. You see, Paul is saying in this statement that in spite of the challenges that come naturally when we hike this way together, in spite of our need and sometimes our lack of humility, in spite of our tendency to be right in the wrong way, in spite of the fact that sometimes the best we can do at church is put up with each other, in spite of all of those things, we are united into a family of God. We must maintain a unity that has already been given, even though we have many weaknesses and differences. And that's actually so much better than being called to create a unity for ourselves. This world is full of failed, created unities. And that's not to say maintaining unity isn't work. It is. We can fail at it. Our own church at times has not done a great job. But this is a real gift. It's one that transcends our challenges and differences and gives us hope for our future. Because just as there is one hope, one path to God, Jesus Christ. There is, as Paul says here in Ephesians 4, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. And he ends in the first last couple of verses, 15 and 16, talking about one body that is built up and built together through all its members. And because we are united to God through Christ, we are united to each other by Christ. And that's a firm, unshifting foundation to practice these things that Paul preaches here in Ephesians 4. So this morning I hope we're thankful as we're challenged by these things because we have a foundation to practice them on. Now I'd hazard a guess that if you're part of this Christian community here at Epiphany, we're visiting today and part of another church. You probably struggle with at least one of the things on Paul's list, right? Humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another in love, putting up with each other, or maintaining the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. As I conclude this morning, I challenge you. Which one is it? Who and how with whom and how could you work on it as part of walking this path together? Friends, we walk this way together, the way that God has given to us, we have not had to make for ourselves. Admittedly, often in spite of ourselves, but ultimately in his unity which he has given us and in the bond of peace. Amen.